Good morning and welcome to the Sense of Things. It's Jeff and Ron here once again for another episode of Fun Things, Markets, and the Economy. Ron, how are you doing this morning, sir? Good. Just a quick public service note. Drink water. Yes, drink Stay lots. hydrated. You're, what did you say the, the, the weather in uh, Arizona is going to be this week? going to hit 110 today. Yeah. But, I, but that, look, the afternoons are brutal, but you know what? It is, the mornings are terrific, but yeah, it's starting to get soupy in the afternoons. Yeah, I will say Texas, we have the equivalent of 110 and we still haven't hit 100 because we have so much humidity right now that it felt like I was, I was literally swimming out to take trash out at the office. Yeah, good the luck other day. with that. Yeah, Keep now that I, bring a change of clothes for when you go outside. Yeah, pretty much. Good thing is we do that at the end of the day. So I only have to smell myself for about a half an hour before I go home. All right, let's kick it off today. I felt that one thing we haven't visited in a while is our favorite friends, the Florida men. And so I figured it was a good time to kick us off with a little bit of Florida man action and talk a little bit about what's going on in the world of Florida men. So starting off, by the way, and, by the way, real quick with Florida, it's got to be crazy with the heat. So you, you got to just equate it to that. Yeah, but they do this all year long. So I'm not sure why, whatever. All right, so number one, Florida man story, Florida man breaks into a house, cleans it, leaves behind origami. So in 2019, a man identified as Nate Roman from Marlboro, Massachusetts, reported a funny incident that left him shocked. He came home and found an intruder had entered his home, cleaned everything in the house, including spreading his bead and scrubbing the toilet or bed, sp uh, spreading his bead. I think mean, I think they mean fixing his bed up, scrubbing the yeah. toilets. He even, it, what was even more crazy was that he left behind origami roses on his toilet paper rolls. He's got a, he's got a secret admirer. I'm actually impressed. I wish I would get a Florida man here to uh, take care of it. So second one, a Florida man blows a 0.339. Had to be dead. How was he standing? Yeah. That's alcohol level. And gets a DUI on a golf cart. Alfred Constant Matthew went for a cruise on his golf cart while driving on the highway. He was stopped by police that who noticed he was drunk. Maybe the fact that he was driving a golf cart on the highway might have been the first indication. On testing his blood alcohol content, it turned out to be 0.339, which was way above the legal limit and almost to the death limit. He was arrested. If they, if they rang his arm, probably that would be 0.10 alcohol that would squeeze out and sweat. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So here's another good one. Florida man flees cops so fast that some of his clothes come off. So police in, identified him with DNA from his socks. Cops could only find a pair of jeans, shorts, a sandal, and a sock. Now, this guy is so fast that he can run his pants off. I'm thinking Miami Dolphins next year, wide receiver. This is the other thing I'm thinking. Probably they put out an APB of what he was wearing. So he just stripped <laughs> off his clothes because they weren't expecting a naked guy. So he'd rather probably get arrested for indecent exposure than and, whatever and for whatever he got in trouble for. Yeah, yeah it doesn't even say like what he got in trouble. A criminal, I think. I don't know. Yeah, I it's maybe had the forethought at the time to think about this. Florida man tries to walk off out of a store with a chainsaw stuffed down his pants. Anthony Ballard took shoplifting a notch higher by shoplifting a chainsaw. He reportedly entered Treasure Coast Lawn Equipment, engaged the cashier in small talk while hiding the power tool in his pants. Jeff, there's got to be video of this. There's yeah, gotta there's got to be video of it, of him stubbing in his pants and the, the employee saying, is that a chainsaw in your pants or are you just happy to see me? Depends whether or not it was on or not. Well, that's true. That could be a problem. And we did have that one picture a few months ago where- Could have gotten a second guys... circumcision. Yep, exactly. Interestingly enough. All right, my favorite one of all, Florida man arrested for crashing a car into a mall, says he was trying to time travel a car and crashed into the mall at North Davis Highway in Pensacola, Florida. When cops questioned the unidentified man driving the Dodge Challenger, he said he was trying to time travel when the incident occurred. Now, if he'd have had a DeLorean, he'd have been there, but unfortunately he chose the Dodge Challenger. 
Did he hit 88 miles an hour? That's the true question. I don't know. My wife owns a Dodge Challenger. The V6 can get up. It's pretty fast. It's like a 6.3, zero to 60. You should be able to get to 88 miles per hour in it. All but right. apparently he did not have the flux capacitor filled or the, the Back to the Future 2 where it's the Vegematic thing that's in there. He just didn't fill it up. Gotcha. All right. Yeah. All right. Let's, let's talk about my stuff for the day. Are we heading for a soft landing or an iceberg? This is one of my favorite terms that I hear from the stupidity of the government um, and a lot of the market pundits. Financial about media. Maybe. Media. Yeah. Soft landing, soft landing. Are Hold we on. Did have you ever landing? hear Jerome Powell ever say harder soft landing? No. Nope. No. Not once ever. There is no such thing as a soft landing. It is an iceberg in most cases. And if you are looking for the Fed or anybody, the Treasury or the Fed to rescue the economy, if you look at their history, it has been absolutely atrocious when it comes to this. They usually wait way too long to come in and try and slow things down, which they did this time by almost 18 months. And I would argue the point, it was probably since 2010, that soft money policy just inflated assets and caused a lot of issues that we're now dealing with. But the other side of the coin is, is it an iceberg and when do we hit it? We don't know, nor did the Titanic know that there was going to be an iceberg there. Well, they, you know, on they, our last they, they show, we, well, they were just weren't looking. Yeah, exactly. And I, on the last show... We t just touched at the end, Ron talked a little bit about JOLTS, the JOLTS report, which is job openings report. This comes from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And if you can see after the peak in about 2022, which was about 12 million, part of that was that you had so many people that were laid off. And as the economy was starting to come back, there was a ton of job openings because people were looking, literally there was or higher signs everywhere. And you had people during the pandemic that didn't want to go back to work. And the government was basically paying them not to go back to work. We've seen that get pulled back down. So the open job openings are, are reducing, but there's been an accelerated trend as of late, pretty much late 2023, going into 2024, and it's accelerating even more. And I would I would garner to say that is also companies now starting to pull back on jobs. They're just not, the open jobs aren't there because companies are pulling back and you're starting to see big layoffs in the tech space. That probably was because they went too far the other way, but we're starting to see those jobs pull back, which if you look at the long-term trend, it's getting back to where the long-term trend was. But does it keep going beyond that? And we start to drop into a situation like we typically see before big well, We got a divergence because unemployment has ticked up mm -hmm. and the job openings are coming down. Yeah. Yeah. And non-farm payrolls here, once again, another sign of that. If you look at year over year, you know, around 275, we came in this month or, or last month around... I think it was 175. And if you look at the ADP number that came out earlier this week, it was around 152. It had been expected to be in line with where it came in last month. So it'll be interesting because tomorrow is that non-farm payroll number for the month of May. And does this continue to decline? And is it continued year over year decline? Why is that important? It is a sign of a slowing economy. But the challenge that we have now is we have really high interest rates and we have massive amounts of, of, of consumer credit. And if this continues to increase and unemployment continues to increase, that's going to put a massive strain on the consumer, basically. We didn't even talk about treasury debt and interest payments. But oh, that's God, okay. that's a whole nother animal. They can just, they have the ability to print money. We don't. Hourly earnings. This was something I hadn't looked at in a long time. And I just happened to uh, catch it. I think it was on the non farm payrolls section of briefing.com. It was an extra chart. And hourly earnings year over year have been declining just continually, which is you look at inflation and inflation's gone this way and hourly earnings are going that way. And once again, we're seeing that accelerate to the downside as well.
And they say wage growth is going up, but. Yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> it's like wage growth is going up. Here's a chart from the Bureau of Labor Statistics and it ain't going up. I'm sorry, it's going down significantly. And if you look at real wage growth with inflation, it ain't good because we're at 4% and inflation's basically at what? Four or what, five something at this point? I think it's under, I think it's just under four. Okay. Uh, so it's, you're, ba you're breaking even at this point. Unemployment, like you were talking about, we had that spike up in, in the, during the pandemic. It had been coming down pretty significantly throughout the, basically from the peak of the 2008 period, the Great Recession, it had gone all the way down below 4%. And we're starting to eke our way back up to 4% and above at this point. So it tends not to move rapidly, but it's starting to move in the direction you don't really want to see it go at that point. Inflation, once again, yes, it's gone down. Oh, it's gotten better. Yeah, but it's just starting to level off here when we look at inflation and it's leveling off at a much higher level than where the Fed is willing to accept. And this is the, the PCE number. This is the number that the Fed uses and that they trust the most. And it's still very far away from where their target is of 2% at that point. And the once last again, mile is always the toughest. Yeah. And trying to lose that last 10 pounds or whatever is always going to be the toughest as well. And it's going to take some major moves or the economy kind of coming unglued to really get that number down. Home prices. This is something I was interested in as I was looking through all this. What is home? What are home prices look like? Because we've got really high in the sevens range on 30 year mortgages at this point. House prices have slowed. The average house price is about $425,000, but it's not declining rapidly. It's just leveling off. And the challenge that we run into with that is we don't have enough inventory. And the bigger challenge is. The baby boom generation, which has traditionally been the generation that's driven everything economy-wise in the world, what's happened with them? Well, they had these big, huge houses where they had big, huge families, and now they're retiring and they're downsizing. And unfortunately, they're downsizing right into the inventory that normally would be the young people coming in as a starter home. And, and what I don't understand, and I haven't heard a cogent argument or any legitimacy of why post-COVID prices just went parabolic. Oh, yeah. Because with 10,000 people essentially hitting 65 every day or plus or minus, people are downsizing. Yeah. So that's why new home sales are spiking, mm -hmm. obviously, because there's no inventory existing home sales and uh, a 7% plus 30-year fixed is slowing that, that down. But I don't understand if you take a look, what is that, a 70 year history almost? Yeah. 60 year history. Why post COVID, it literally has gone up, if you look at it, almost 35%. Yeah. In a four year period of time. And I haven't heard any legitimacy behind why that's happened. I think from my perspective, it was cheap money. You know, during that time period, you could. Basically, you Hold know, on, to interrupt you, but it was cheap following the financial crisis through 2019. Yep. Cheap money. I think this cheap money and the ability for people to relocate because they could work independently, the ability to relocate. And quite frankly, the people willing to just pay stupid money for houses. I remember, well, I had a client, perfect example, had what I would consider a very average house. It was probably 45, maybe 50 years old, little bit of renovations, but not anything dramatic. And this was right at the beginning of kind of 2000, rolling into 2021. She sold her house here in Austin for 40% more than what she listed it for. So it was like, it was maybe a $300,000 house. She sold for $125,000, $450,000. And the people that bought the house came in and ripped it down and put another, it built a whole new house from ground up. So they paid $475,000 for a lot and a house that they were going to rip down and then 
probably built another $500,000 house on top of it. It was not a million dollar neighborhood by any way, shape or form. And, and it still isn't to this day. So it was just people willing to pay stupid money for it. But it's amazing to me how persistent that price has been afterwards. Yes, the parabolic side of it. Typically, when you see a parabolic upward, you're going to typically see some kind of a pretty massive downward. And it's not. It's flat at best at this point. So it's really shocking to me from a real estate perspective. Yeah, I don't understand it either. And I think my last point that I want to make out of this is the trend of the newest trend of unretiring. Uh, as many as 20% of older workers are rejoining the labor market in their 60s and 70s. As of late 2023, there was nearly twice the percentage of Americans over the age of 65 working compared to the 1980s. And this is by Pew Research. And I think this is one, it's an interesting trend because you have a workforce and I will just say now I had somebody work for me for three weeks in another business from the wealth management practice and quit via text. So I think part of it is the new younger workforce is not necessarily willing to work as hard, but I think a lot of these folks that retired and thought, okay, I'm just done. You know, a lot of them retired even early during the pandemic, you know, just saying, oh, screw it. I'll just go ahead and retire early. And then inflation's come back to bite them hard. And I would venture to say that number is even higher than 20%. What's your thoughts? I always, when I talk to clients that are pre-retirees, I always say there's a difference between when you reach a certain age that you have to work yeah. or you want to work. Yeah. Big difference, huge difference. And where I'm going with that is the following. I think people are working longer now because they're in better health, yeah. better living through chemistry, better health. Mm -hmm. But I think the other reason is if you love what you do and you enjoy getting up in the morning, why would you quit? Let's say you're not a golfer. You're not a traveler. Yep. What are you going to do? Sit around, gain weight, eat? Yeah. But my point is that you can hit a certain age and be somewhat financially stable, not 100%, and mm -hmm. go, I'm going to throttle back. I have yeah. lots of clients in their 70s that are still working, and they enjoy getting up every day. And it's not a grind. And most of them, I would say, not only do they enjoy working, but they don't have to work, mm -hmm. but they enjoy working. Plus yeah. the additional income allows sure. them to take an extra vacation or do something else mm -hmm. that they want to do. Or here's the other big thing. They enjoy working because that extra money helps them provide for their kids or grandkids or extended family mm -hmm. because they're struggling. Yeah. So it's a different age. Back in the day, you hit 65. It was like Logan's run. You were done. <laughs> Right, <laughs> you're the out. light was blinking in your palm at that point. You're, you're, you're out. But today, it's a very, it's a very different story. I give these. We're not sixty right yet, there. but yeah. people ask me, Ron, we're planning 10, 15 years out. When are you looking to retire? Yeah. What are you talking about? My father's eighty-three. Yeah. He's still in the business. He's not sure. putting in forty hours a week, but he loves the business. He yeah. enjoys the business. So if he didn't and it was stressful, he wouldn't be doing it. Neither would mm. I. Neither would you. No, so it's a different, yeah. different if you, if you enjoy what you're doing and you don't have to do it. My dad's a great example of this. He's 84 years old and he works for Lowe's and he works in the hardware section, which it he that's what he loves. He was a quality control engineer. So if you ask him, how do I fix this? He's going to show you how to take every screw, what tools you're going to need, everything else. And he loves it. And it's that interaction. And basically he and my mom had almost 15 years of travel and all that. And he's not a golfer and he's not, he's done every project around the house at this point. So he was really getting to that point where it was like, okay, I can just sit here and read books for the rest of my life and die or get up and do this. And he works the, the schedule that they give him, but he's also very specific about, I do not want to work more than 20 hours a week but hurts my back if I'm on my feet that much. He's just, it keeps him healthy. He looks great. He's, it keeps his weight down and everything else. And my mom does volunteer work. So I think exactly it is a different generation. Exactly riding the coattails of that, Jeff. Yep. 
to creating a lifestyle that makes sense to them. And if Absolutely. it involves working, what's the big deal? Yeah. Volunteer. A lot of people like volunteer. I tell people, don't do nothing. You yeah. know, do something, volunteer, work part time, do something that you enjoy. Yeah. And I've worked with retirees for 30 years. And I tell people all the time, I've met some of the youngest 90 year olds in the world and some of the oldest 60 year olds. And it's how you adjust yourself to that. Yes, unretiring, I think part of it is financial. <laughs> uh, but I think yeah. the other side of that is exactly where, where you and I are coming from. It's not a death sentence to go back to work. It's the ability to go, you know what? I'm going to go back to work, but you know what? I'm also retired. I just do this part-time and I'm going to take some time off. So yeah. if you've got something that is a saleable skill, whether it's your ability to work or it's the knowledge in your head that you spent 40 years learning, I don't intend to retire. I can write books until I'm a hundred years old. I can do what I do for a living, managing people's money. I don't dig ditches for a living. So as long as my brain's still working, I can keep doing this. Yeah, I hear you. Everybody's different, but yep. there's no de facto line of demarcation at 65. No, you're just not going to sit there on the front porch and whittle wood until you die. The reality is we... We went from 1938, the average the average life expectancy, I just looked this up the other day for a book I'm writing, the average life expectancy was like 63 years old in 1938. I did the same thing for many uh, seminars I've spoken at in the past. 1912 was 54. Yeah, yeah. So when you think about Social Security, it was a pretty good bet. You started it at 65 and the average age was like 63. So it was a great bet from the government that, okay, we'll just take care of the people that actually live beyond that time period. What they didn't realize was, oh crap, what happens when we get really good at keeping people alive until they're in their 80s? That's the challenge that we face today. Or 90s. Or 90s, yeah. It's going up. It creeps up every year. Folks, thank you for uh, joining us as always. We, we do the sense of things for that very purpose for you and you only it's not for ron to get on uh, ron and i to get on here and show you funny stuff every week it's really for us to give you information and i hope you enjoy this and i hope it gives you some ideas about what you're doing in your own portfolios so make sure you subscribe to the channel make sure that you hit that little upvote button to let us know that you exist because we're seeing a huge amount of new people joining us on the show and if you're new to the show thank you for being on and thank you for being a subscriber so thanks a lot, and we'll see you guys back here the very next time.